Crest is a not-for-profit organization which promotes research, development, and professional regulation in the technical information security industry. As chair of the CIS forum between 2009 and 2012, he played a significant role in development of a partnership between the private sector and the UK government to improve the quality of information assurance practices. Ian was a fellow of the Business Continuity Institute and was voted Business Continuity Consultant of the Year in 2001 and 2003. Prior to this, he was founding partner of Insight Consultant, Consulting, which is one of the leading independent IT security consultancies. So please welcome Ian Glover. <coughs> So the scary thing about uh, working with this institution for a little while is that uh, all of a sudden your bio gets well out of date. So, so I apologise for the out of date bio. Um, some of this has been already covered in terms of, of what, we're, what we're actually about in terms of Crest. Uh, the important thing has been mentioned which we are a not-for-profit organisation. But predominantly we are, we are in support of the buying community in the provision of accredited organisations and certified individuals. And in that there's a whole pile of other activities that, that we also adopt. So if you look up the, the, the top left hand corner, the company membership, uh, that's what we do. We are credit organisations on an international basis that provide penetration testing services, threat intelligence services and cyber incident response. Uh, in the UK, for example, we have 72 organisations. Uh, we, we have a number in other, in other regions. Uh, but it's a significant representation of particularly the penetration testing industry and, and an increasing representation of the incident response and threat intelligence. Um, in addition to that, we tie that together with professional qualifications. Uh, and I'll come on to that a little bit more because I believe that's one of the important bedrocks we have to have if we're going to solve some of the problems in terms of cybercrime that we're experiencing right now. Uh, but our professional qualifications are really professional. So in other words, they're extremely hard. Uh, there's over a thousand people in the UK qualified against the Crest standards, and that's taken us quite a long time to get to. The interesting thing that ties those two elements together, the company membership and the certification, is that it, there are codes of conduct. We've talked about conduct a little bit already. Um, ours are meaningfully enforceable, which I think is a really important thing. And so if we remove a company from our register, uh, effectively that would remove their ability to work for the Bank of England, uh, the Financial Services Authority, which would remove their ability to work with top tier UK financial services organisations. In addition to that, we have a back-to-back -back agreement with GCHQ under their check scheme. If we remove somebody from our register who's on the check scheme, I believe the government would do the same. And so in other words, in one fell swoop, we could remove a company's ability to operate in UK financial services and government. It's quite a big stick. Uh, if you internationalise that, which I'll come on to in a little while, as we're working with more and more overseas regulators and government, that will become increasingly more important and therefore the stick gets much bigger. I never want to have to use it, um, but it's absolutely there and we would enforce it and, and we do investigations on a regular basis on behalf of the buying community. In addition to that, the individuals sign up to a code of conduct which says they will adopt the policies, processes and procedures of the company that they're working for. Really important because you want a trusted company and qualified and certified individuals. And again, it's much more binary. We keep somebody in, we throw them out or we throw them out for a little while. So again, that would, interestingly enough, remove their ability to work in UK government. It would remove their ability to work again top tier financial services. And some of our member companies are now building that into their contracts. So in other words, if you're viewed as being inappropriate and you've been removed from the register for malpractice, uh, then there are some reasons for, for dismissal. It's quite strong. Tying that together, we also look at our knowledge sharing. And, and some of this stuff I'm going to be talking about today covers some of those knowledge sharing. Uh, everything we do is IPR free. We're very collaborative as an organisation. And what we're trying to do is to harmonise and pull these things together. And some of the research opportunities that are available in this university and others, uh, we are absolutely in support of. And we try very hard to work collaboratively, both with industry, with regulators and government, with the police forces, and also with academia to pull those things together into a meaningful thing we can implement within the community. And finally, you've got the professional development side of things. And really what we're trying to do there is to define this as a profession. And the reason for that is, is we've got a number of things that we've got to address. We've got increasing demands on the cybersecurity industry. As you can just hear from the two presentations and the introduction, we have, we have a real problem here that's only getting bigger and only getting more complicated, and therefore we need to react as an industry to be able to overcome those and act to provide assurances to the public and to our, our industry that, that our systems and our processes are actually secure, and there are ways to, to actually test those. 
there is a massive school, school shortage risk. So in other words, if we can't get the right people into the industry, then how on earth are we going to protect the industry, the wider industry and the wider community? And it's not only a problem for us, it's exactly the same for academia. And to put up a list of the people that, that actually represent here is quite an achievement to get that many people who are experts in their field working in this particular institution because the demands for those individuals are across the world, not just across the UK. And if you then roll that back to the professional services sector, which I represent, then again, those, those issues are exactly the same. We're all competing for the very best people, and there aren't enough of them about. And some of the ones that we have got are not actually skilled enough to provide the services we need. In addition to that, there's a, there's a varying level of assurance we need to do. So if you're an SME processing no public information, no, no personal information, no financial information, you need a certain level of assurance in terms of your systems. If all of a sudden you fall under and you start to do payments then through credit cards, then you've got to do it into the PCI community. So you have to go into the payment cards. If you're working in government, then again, you're going to have to look at certain levels of assurance. And if you're working at critical parts of the national infrastructure, again, you've got a different target in terms of the types of people that are likely to attack you. They've got different resources. They've got different motivations. They've got different timescales. And therefore, the level of assurance in that level must be much greater. And at the moment, I don't believe we've got enough of a split between those types of activities. And our organisations and our governments and our systems don't really know what it is they should be applying that is good practice in this area. Because it varies in terms of the risk and it varies in terms of the types of people that are likely to attack you. And finally, this isn't a closed border problem, as has already been highlighted. Unless we view this from an international perspective, then I don't think we're going to solve our problems. We must start to collaborate more on an international basis to make these things work together. And that's both in terms of law enforcement, but also in terms of standards and in terms of the way we actually adopt these things. If we think the criminal fraternity aren't using their international borders as a benefit to them, uh, we, we must be joking. You know, absolutely, that's, that's what they're doing. And we need to be able to do the same for the protection areas, and we need to collaborate more on an international basis to make that operate. So, quite an overused remark, I believe, is we have a skill shortage. But what on earth does that mean? We have a skill shortage, we have a lack of skills. So in other words, we've got people already in the industry, we have some of our auditors, some of those people that do 27,001 audits, for example, that don't understand how to read a vulnerability assessment report, which is quite a scary thing. We have certain people that, that say they're old like me generally, and they say they're really good because they've been doing this stuff for a long time, but how do you actually validate that I'm any good at what I do, and how do I identify what my skill gaps are to actually improve it? In addition to that, we also have got an increase in terms of the number of people we need to bring into the industry. Um, interesting enough, if you look at the overall cybersecurity industry, we are very typical. So 55, male, white, all of the things that are causing us a demographic problem to drop off the end. If you look at my particular part of the industry, the penetration testing and incident response, we have less of a problem. We're much more diverse. We're not very gender neutral and gender balanced, but in terms of the age, in terms of the academic background, and in terms of the types of people that we employ, we're actually a very diverse area. And if we can replicate that in other places and actually address the gender balance at the same time, I think we can do a good job. There's also a, jap gra ga a gap in the journey. So in other words, we do come on a journey. You know, a lot of people came into this industry that, that are old like me and we fell into it. I, I actually chose it, which is really very sad, uh, but a lot of people came into it from other directions. But there is a gap in terms of how we get school children through into these types of academic institutions and then into the industry, into the working environment. And therefore what we need is to look at this from a short, medium and long term plan. We need short term actions because we need people right now. We need medium plans, in other words, we need to broaden out the horizon of people that we're going to address and pull into this industry. When I first came here, we had 40 people-ish, and now we've got 150-ish people going through, through the university here. You know, that's a fantastic increase. We need thousands. How on earth are we going to scale that up to actually meet the demands in terms of what we need, both for law enforcement, for government, for professional services, for product development, etc.? And therefore, we need career planning to both address the problems and the timescales. So, coming back to that gap, a career, individuals journey through work and other aspects of their life. Really interesting thing, and I'm sure I know what I want to do when I grow up, but I'm not quite grown up yet. Uh, but there's an awful lot of people out there that actually want a career. And so what we need to do is we need to bridge this gap in terms of the shortage of the industry 
and therefore we've got to attract more young people in general. So in other words, if we start the hopper really wide and we tell people this is an exciting place to operate and a really exciting industry, we can therefore start to select and come down to the people that actually want to join the industry itself. We obviously need a more diverse workforce, and I don't just mean that in terms of gender neutrality. I think we need to look at different people in terms of the types of individuals that are coming through into the industry itself. It's very interesting, again, with law enforcement. A lot of the um, cease and desist notices are sent out to generally young men um, who are borderline Asperger's, borderline on the scale. And, and what we need to do is make sure that we're adopting those individuals because they have skills we want. They're very convergent, they're very concentrated, they're good coders generally. And what we need to do is to make sure that we're actually broad church enough to actually encourage those people through and to demonstrate there's a career here, but also to provide them with the support services they need to make sure they can function within an industry. In addition to that, we need uh, people from related other disciplines. Um, there is a problem at the moment in terms of employment rates for computer scientists, which I find quite incredible. Um, there may be a problem in terms of the quality coming in and quality coming out. It may be a problem in terms of some of the issues of what's actually being taught in the level, but there's still a problem in that domain, and we need to address that. But from a cybersecurity industry, good networking skills, understanding computer science, understanding of some of the disciplines and the way the things operate, good coding background, this all sounds like good background fundamental stuff we could build on to actually encourage people in the industry. Yet we're not looking across to those other industries to attract them in. We need to look at other people from other industries. Um, again, I'll, I haven't got time to go into it too much, but there are a significant number of people working in SOX, NOX, computer operation centres, uh, help desk, web apps, that we could cross-train into our industry. And again, from a short-termist perspective, we can do that very quickly. But what we need to do is to have the support of academia and training organisations, and the government maybe to help pump prime, but the industry to absolutely adopt it to bring these people through. And that would help from the short term. And finally, people returning to work. A massive opportunity for us again. People that are used to home working, uh, people that are returning to work after career breaks for various reasons. Again, if we can do conversion courses and things, we can bring them in. So what we're trying to do here is to look at the negative industry uh, image that we have, because I believe we have a, a negative image in some areas. There's a lack of awareness of careers and options available to you. And I'll come on to that in a minute in terms of the next slide. The industry doesn't necessarily have a recognised development path. I would like to think Crest has helped with this in our very small domain. We don't represent the whole of the cyber security industry, but we have a career pathway that you understand how to get in and you understand what it means to actually progress up in terms of your technical discipline. Um, we've also got a significant number of other university courses available that relate to different aspects of what we do. And again, we're not focusing in on those to draw those people into our industry in the most effective way we can. So how do you get into this industry? We ask the question, what do you want to be? Generally, these are the sorts of things that you get from a normal educational background. These, these are the things that people generally come out with. I did a school a little while ago. I do a lot of careers talks at schools. And I had two young men, it was an all boys school, um, independently say to me they wanted to be actuaries. Are there any actuaries in the room? No, they're obviously going off and doing something really exciting because it's a really boring job. Um, but basically, they'd, they'd identified somebody who came in to speak to their school. They had a really nice car. They were talking about stats and maths. They went home and spoke to their parents. Their parents went, yeah, great, it's a good career. They spoke to their careers advisor and went, yes, we think you should do statistics and mathematics at university. Really easy. And then if you compare that with the top 10 choices in terms of careers, then there is some interesting stuff in there. You know, the sports side of things is, is an aspirational career, so I'll dismiss that. Uh, I was never going to be a good sportsman. I always wanted to be an astronaut, and I wasn't going to quite get there. Um, but, but we have to look at those aspiration ones and maybe adopt those very slightly in terms of the, the celebrity focus in terms of what we do. So excluding this, we need a plan B. So if somebody comes up to you and says, I want a career in this industry, generally, as a young person, I'll say, I want to be a hacker. You know, even the hacker forums and things that are run at this university are using those sorts of terms, which can be flipped in a positive or a negative way. And I think the parental advice at that point might be, I think you need a plan B. Generally, if you report it in school, they'll either ask you to look at the school network, which is really scary, or if you say it at home, they'll take your kit away from you. So you really don't want to do that. And the professions that are of interest have a structured career, and they're supported by professional bodies. 
They have materials available that describe what the industry looks like from a careers perspective, and they have individuals from those industry encouraging people to come into schools. Are we really doing that as an industry? I don't think we are yet. So, that manifestation, I want to work in cyber, I want to be a hacker, um, Again, that is supported by the press and media with obviously the, the negative connotation and the manifestation of computer security. It's really difficult to understand what this really means. And it, in many ways, some young people view that going onto the dark side is a way of getting onto the light side and getting a really good job. And particularly in the US, people are still employing on those bases. Yet we look at the criminal justice system, that doesn't support that type of activity at all. And nor do we as an industry. So what do we do about it? We've got to look at what the parents' view is and the careers advisors, as well as influencing the young people. And if we don't address all of those three subject areas, then I think we're going to fail. So if the cybersecurity industry is going to be viewed as being a profession, it's got to demonstrate certain things. We've got to attract the very best people into our industry. And really, at the moment, because lots of other hard parts of engineering are competing in the same space, because they've got even greater demographic problem than we have, we've got to be better than them in terms of what we do. We must have defined career paths that are understandable. And we must have the buying community going to have confidence in terms of what's actually been provided from our professional services and our product set. And we must build positives around the negative. We mustn't ignore cyber CSI because it's stupid. It is stupid. Um, I would really love it. I, I, particularly, I, I love using the term cyber dust in virtually every presentation I can think of. I have no idea what it is. Um, but again, if you look at those sorts of media type things, we can take positives because people are talking about it. Even the good wife is talking about driverless cars and litigation. So we can look at these things and drive things through in a positive way. But we do really need to build the positives around the negative, and we've got to be really good at what we do, because we are competing as an industry with other more established industries. So what can we do? Here's some of the pathways that we've started to look at. And if you look at the ITGCSE, I really like it. It's got six elements of cybersecurity in it, um, and I think they're actually quite good. You know, we've contributed as Crest to the Tech Partnership and some of the other people that are looking at the definition. We're working with the awarding bodies to try to put more content in there to try to allow organisations, sorry, allow the schools to deliver these things in an appropriate way. We have a whole pile of stuff from the Tech Partnership, Digital Defenders and some of the interactive posters, which I haven't got time to show you, um, in terms of providing that material out to schools, in including actually classroom-based support. In addition to that, we've got really good STEM clubs. We've got an emerging loads and loads of co uh, computer clubs and coding clubs. And what we've got to do is to build on those in terms of moving the process forward. The massively disappointing thing from my perspective is I wanted the first Asperger's type person or, or home educated individual or the person that's at the back of the class that's disruptive because they're bored to walk in and throw across their A-star computer science um, and to their maths teacher and go, I'm quite good at what I do because I've done this on my own. And then what they've done with the ITGCSE is 40% of that has got to be assessed work in classrooms. I don't even know how I'm going to de deliver that from a, from a perspective of having home educators, let alone trying to get a wider areas. And we haven't got enough teachers that have got the skills and we haven't got enough teachers that are interested. And to be quite honest, I don't think we're going to get a massive in in influx in terms of the schools themselves. So we've got this fantastic opportunity we can do on a global basis, and we've just messed it up a little bit because we're worried about cheating, which is the, the argument. I test 10,000 hour plus year, 10,000 hours plus penetration testers that have been doing this job for 15 years. Um, if I can stop them cheating, mostly, um, then, then I believe we can do that for school children. But you've got to look at these things and build on them in terms of the activities. And I really like the idea of having the, the computer clubs and some of the challenges and things. As an industry, for example, we're at Big Bang, 70,000 school children. Uh, we went there with a Digital Defenders uh, banner um, supported by Cabinet Office and Biz and some industry partners. Uh, but this is open to anybody. So if there's anybody here that wants to go to an educational fair or wants to go and speak to school children about anything at all, all of the material we've got here is freely available and we'll give it to you. Just go out there and use it because what we're trying to do is to structure it. And what we'd like is more material. And again, some of that collaborative research on challenges and things I think would be really useful. 
We're aiming for 150,000 school children in a year. That's uh, to give you an idea of how big we want the hopper to be. And at that particular show, we had over 1,500 young people volunteering to do a cipher challenge. Really good. We then move on to the A-level <coughs> side of things. Complete disaster at this point. We've started off talking about cyber, and then we ignore it completely. There is nothing in the A-level syllabus in computer science in cyber at all. So what do we have to do? We've got to look at the information technology, the computing and competitions, because if we've got an interest in the first place, we've got to retain that interest even longer now because we've missed the A-level opportunity to at least allow them the opportunity to research it further. I think we need some student guides. We've started to write those. Um, and again, if anybody wants to see those, they're, they're actually in draft, but we've given out thousands of them so far. Uh, and we also, I think, need an industry film describing what it is that we do in a format of sort of the great campaign type, type level quality films. And I think if we got together, we could do that. And again, what we're trying to do as a whole industry is to have a big hopper and tell people we're interested. Because we can't employ them at that point, but we can employ them later. We then come on to the related degrees, and I think we've got a world-leading um, set of related degrees here. I do a lot of travelling, I do a lot of talks overseas, I listen to a lot of Americans telling me how good they are, and then I come back here and realise we're much better. Um, what we've got here, I think, is we need structured careers guides. Um, if you look at the target set, which is generally what's available in the careers uh, sections in the university, you've got a whole set of target stuff here, I know. Um, but we've got nothing in terms of what a career in cybersecurity looks like. And again, as an industry, I think we should be doing an industry guide to what it looks like to describe to people. We've got industry level marketing plan, and then we've got things like on the, on the bottom here, there's a, there's a website called uh, Inspired Careers. That's right, I double clicked it. where we've now got over 200 day in the life videos of different aspects in terms of what a career looks like in this particular space. I think it's a really good reciprocal for a container for this type of careers information. And if you wanted to be a junior pen tester, so in other words, that hacker, then what you can do is you can go into the room, you can download all of the day in the life videos of people working in the industry at that level. And as I say, we've got over 200 films describing what it's like to work in this particular domain. If I had more time, I'd go into this in a little bit more detail. But please, if you're willing to, just answer the five questions. We'll post it online for nothing. And the hit rates are quite significant. And what we're doing there is we're providing support to describe the university courses and, and all the other aspects in terms of what you might do in terms of developing a career in this space. So there's quite a lot going on. It's not necessarily well collaborated. We've then got the master's degree courses, and again, I think we are second to none in terms of the UK, both in terms of distance learning and face-to-face -face learning. But again, I think we need much better career guidance, and we need graduate guides, and we need those industry films to describe how exciting it is, because we want to encourage more people to do this as part of their overall discipline, not necessarily all of their own discipline. So in other words, the mathematicians and computer science people should have elements of cyber in it, as should the law people, the threat intelligence industry is growing dramatically. The last four young people I've placed, one was an absolute computer science um, graduate, another one was um, PPE, another one was philosophy and ethics, and another one was international terrorism. And I've put those three young people into threat intelligence industries. So it's really interesting that we're looking at quite a broad range of individuals here. And then finally, we're looking here in terms of the way that we're getting. The higher apprenticeship programs, level fours and level fives, pay as you learn, uh, getting paid as you learn, is, is something I think we should all get behind. And in addition to that, industry recognition in terms of transfer courses, conversion courses to allow other people to come in. And again, I think we can align those with the existing syllabus for the, um, the higher apprenticeship programs and also the degree programs and deliver those through academia and training organisations. And then what we do is we then get these people into the profession and provide them with a career path. And that's what we need to do, that common aspect in terms of understanding what certification means, understanding what awards means, and understanding what the career path opportunities are, I think is the way we're going to increase the numbers and also get the very best people into this industry, which is what I think we need. From a Crest perspective, this is what we do. We start people at practitioner level, so around about 1,800 hours, 2,000 hours, coming off a degree course like the specialist ones here. 
and, and then we move up to registered level around about 6,000 hours and then the specialist areas at 10,000 hours. Absolutely typical of what you'd see in accountancy, audit, medical, engineering, structural design and engineering. We haven't, what we've have done is just stolen those ideas, but these are really hard exams and they're meaningful in the marketplace and certainly in penetration testing, intrusion analysis, malware reverse engineering, threat intelligence, security architecture, they are meaningful things in terms of your salary expectations and the types of organisations you'd work for. So, in this particular space what we need, a long term view. I really need some help with these school based activities. We really need to get together as an industry to do something about this. On the medium side of things we need to support university students finding work placements and job opportunities. It is surprisingly hard uh, for some people to find jobs. It's interesting because some people come in with the inability to carry a UK national um, uh, security clearance, uh, but that doesn't stop you working in the industry. It just means it limits some of the organisations you might work for or some of the jobs. But what we need to do is a structured way of encouraging more organisations to not always go for the mature hires, but to invest in young people. If we all only do mature hires, all we're going to do is go round and round and round in circles and the salaries are going to be uh, escalated. And what we need to do is to look at ways to convert people in from other industries and really importantly linked into the NCA and the Prevent Programme, we need to put intervention points to stop young people going into cybercrime. In other words, we've got to fill that gap between 16 to maybe 18 or 18 or 21 and we've got to keep their interest and keep them on the straight and narrow, doing interesting, useful things for the community. And then the short-term, I believe, conversion courses. And I'm putting a lot of pressure in the government and some of my industries that I represent to try to get conversion courses both up and running and encourage people to take them up. And I think that's a big opportunity for some short-term gains. I thought I'd just mention some of the schemes uh, because the next bit I was going to talk about was this, this categorisation of the level of assurance. And there's a lot of schemes out there and I'm responsible for quite a few of them, unfortunately, so I'm to blame for a lot of this stuff. Uh, but there's the Crest general thing in terms of penetration testing incident response. There's the CBEST scheme operated by the Bank of England for critical parts of the UK financial services. There's the STAR scheme that we're responsible for, which we're rolling out into other areas of the critical national infrastructure, including telecommunications and nuclear civil. Uh, we've got the CHECK scheme here, which is responsible for penetration testing and cyber incident response within the UK government. And then we've got the CIR scheme down here, operated by Cabinet Office, uh, which looks at um, state-sponsored attack and very serious organised crime. And then right at the other end of the scale, we've got Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, looking at basic cyber hygiene. So it looks like we're just inventing this stuff all willy-nilly for no apparent reason. But if you put them into a hierarchy, then we can start to understand the level of assurance that we can be provided. Really interestingly, in addition to that, we can also start to look at the level of competence the individuals need to actually do work in these areas. So if we do look at the categorisation, the types of organisations or the types of systems we're looking at, if we've got these very small low-risk businesses with no access to personal information, you know, right at the bottom level, practitioner level is probably good enough. But if we're looking right at the top of the stack in terms of critical national infrastructure, I absolutely want specialist experts in that area that have been regularly tested and demonstrably understand the environment in which they're working. And in the middle here, I think that middle section of the penetration testing probably needs to be broken in half. Then all of a sudden, it looks a little bit like a five-level maturity model. And therefore, lots of the other stuff starts to apply and lots of the other schemes and systems that we operate in, that operate outside of the cyber and the IT environment all start to make sense because we can apply those to those five levels. So what we need to do, we need to build a career pathway around these schemes and others. As I say, if we understand how we're going to use the right organisations and how we're going to use the right people to do this work, we're starting to win. We need to expand the categorisation in here to understand what it means in the different services and the different sectors. Because the language I've tried to put up there in one slide is probably understandable to most, but there, if you're looking at the civil nuclear areas, then we need to look at industrial control systems, we need to look at the, the administrative systems around it, we need to look at the interface and the management systems that sit over the, over the top of the whole thing to link these things together. And then we need to understand how to categorise them as we link them together with IP, which is a really scary place. We also need to understand what we're doing with the Internet of Things. I can't believe that we can turn on a coffee machine remotely by hacking into it, 
surely that would fail a safety case. I don't understand why they can use really bad software to imp implement that type of technology because you couldn't do it. You couldn't put a poorly designed plug on the end of it. So why enable that from an internet perspective? So there are other things that we need to do right at the bottom areas to actually improve this. But we need some skills in terms of actually understanding how to do the implementation. We need to adopt this categorization so we're not spending money inappropriately. If we've got CNI type activities, absolutely we should be spending a significant amount of money to protect them. The likelihood of attack is quite low, but the impact of an attack, a successful attack, is catastrophic. And why wouldn't you attack the national infrastructure if you're looking at a state-sponsored attack? I would. We need to link to existing standards. We mustn't be reinventing the world in terms of the categorisation. And therefore, if we're doing good things under PCI, or we're doing good things under ISO 27001 from a security policy perspective, we need to link those things together and understand how they all fit. And at the moment, I think it's a really confused landscape. And I think we're doing the buying community no benefit in terms of how we're actually providing those. International. International is really interesting. From a security perspective, it's quite interesting. When I first had my first burglar alarm put on my flat, um, the idea was that I was going to make my front door look more secure than my next door neighbours. Really very social, but it's how it was sold to me. So in other words, I look a bit more secure, therefore they're going to knock next door. Right? It's not a very social responsibility view, uh, but it's absolutely how they used to sell um, alarm systems. Probably still do. From an internet perspective, in terms of an attack perspective, that doesn't, that doesn't come into play. So in other words, what they'll do is they'll attack everybody because it's really cheap, really easy, and they'll knock on everybody's door. So if you've got a dummy burglar alarm, it's useless to you. That isn't going to deter somebody, and it isn't going to make them rob your next door neighbor. What we need to do is to look at that from an international perspective. There's a lot of talk, even today, about the Chinese. Right? I do quite a lot of work in Hong Kong. Hong Kong would like to take a lot of the standards that we have and to move them into China because China is experiencing cyber-related issues in terms of its business. They're losing IPR because they're actually spending more on IPR development than we are, so we might as well steal it back from them if, if you uh, subscribe to the idea they stole it off us in the first place. Um, and, there's, and their social areas have been targeted in exactly the same way we are, and their use of technology is moving forward as quick, if not quicker than ours, and therefore the public need protection. We've got to look at this from a case of international organisations, international trades and international governments, and we need to think about how we're going to solve these problems on an international stage. If we compartmentalise, I think it's going to cause us problems. And if we really believe that the internet is a boundaryless environment, try to buy a, a, a flight in South Africa in RAND from a UK IP address and you won't do it. So we can do these things if we're really clever. From a Crest perspective, then, this week we've signed agreements with the Hong Kong Monetary <coughs> Authority and the National Cyber Agency to put the standards we've developed into the UK into Singapore, which will cover most of the Southeast Asian region. Over the next two weeks, we'll sign something up with a major research organisation within Hong Kong and again within the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. And within a year, the standards that we've put in place for the Bank of England and some of the minimum standards we have in terms of accreditation and certification will be applied across Southeast Asia, including Malaysia. In addition to that, we've got the USA and we're doing some really interesting work with some of the major agencies in the US, particularly looking at cyber incident response and looking at the way we're going to be doing vulnerability assessment in the future, particularly at the basic cyber hygiene levels. I think watch this space because we're going to be signing contracts extremely quickly. But it's a real demonstrability of how good the UK is at this and how what we need to do as a country is to understand that and we need to use that as an ability to export and to an ability to provide assurances that the UK is a good, safe place to do business, because I believe it is. We have a fully operatable chapter in Australia we're doing an awful lot of work in mainland Europe, and we have members across mainland Europe, and I've got five members in Africa. So if you look at this just from a tiny segment in terms of the area of responsibility that I have looking at penetration testing, incident response, and threat intel, we are starting as the UK to make a major impact in terms of what we're doing on the international landscape. And I think, again, if we get together as a community, we can actually take our message out to the whole world, as we've done with academia. Our academic areas in terms of our import opportunities is huge. It's really significant. It causes us a little bit of problems because a lot of the students that come on university courses want to go home 
or, or they haven't got a work permit to work in here, which I think we could address. Uh, but it's a fantastic exporting opportunity. And what we need to do is to look at the overall industry as that opportunity to export, not only to protect ourselves, but to also protect our neighbours. We talked about research here, and, uh, and Crest does quite a lot of research. And what we've done is there, there's research in penetration testing, there's research we've done in terms of incident response, uh, there's work we're doing in terms of secure monitoring and logging, and the potential accreditation of SOC environments. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work looking at the requirements of both the organisations and the individuals. And then we also have some social responsibility research as well. And the one I've put up here is the National Crime Agency on Intervention. Uh, and again, if I was you, I'd go on our website if you're at all interested in that subject, because that's a really good document. Everything we do is IPR free, and, and just print it off and, and share it with anybody you want to. So we spend a lot of money on this with the idea that we're going to share it collaboratively with everybody else. And what we want to do is to work with industry, academia and police forces in, in this particular instance to actually move that whole process forward. So this idea of having a centre for innovation and research for me is fantastic. It gives me a focus in which I can actually start to communicate because if some really good work is being done here, I don't want to replicate it. There is enough for us all to do that if we actually understand what we're all doing, we can deliver it in a much more structured way. So all of that research is free. And I'm really interested in terms of how we can work collaboratively in terms of both academic, applied, and also organisational structural research. We're just about to launch one on industrial control systems as well. And again, we'll be looking at how we're going to tie that into the critical national infrastructure. And the reason I separated that was because you can see from the previous presentations from, from the university, this is an area the university is doing. This is an area we're doing. This is an area that we're looking at with the Nuclear uh, Industries Association, with DEC, and with some of the other government departments and regulators. If we can get them all in the same room, we don't have to replicate things. We can actually draw from the best of principles of all. And therefore, research is really important. So what I'm saying here, we need to define a set of generic career pathways. It can be as general as you like, but we've got to be able to describe that to people entering our industry, either from school, college, university, apprenticeships, degree courses, or career changing, or career coming back in. And if we've got those clearly defined, it makes the pathway in much, much easier, and it looks like our career pathways are structured, which is really good for the people working in the industry. We need to agree our, our qualifications and our certifications and the equivalences. There's quite a lot available. A lot of them are actually poor quality, not very difficult, and directly linked into, into training courses. But if we understand the difference between proper certification and a test at the end of a course, then we can start to identify what's good, who's good, and what those certifications mean, and how you can apply them in a, in a working-based environment. And anything you can do to help us in terms of that long, medium, or short-term opportunity we've got to encourage the very best people into our industry please speak to me. We are desperate in terms of upping the level of skills of the individuals we've currently got, but also I believe it's a fantastic industry to work in, and really I'd like to encourage the brightest and the best people of that, of that as, as a fact, and encourage them in and give them a really magnificent career opportunity like I've had. And finally, innovate. Innovation is fantastic, supported by research, and therefore, anything we can do as an industry that innovates, working together, we can then collaboratively work against the people that are doing us harm. And without that innovation and collaboration, I think we're going to fail. So, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.